website, and I'll be happy to send a PowerPoint and any other material that anyone would wish for. So don't spend your time taking notes, because whatever I say is probably wrong. Whatever is written down is probably <laughs> more correct. I sometimes forget or get carried away. So the science is in the writing. Uh, and of course, thanks. I usually say my thanks at the end, but people get antsy. So really, the first and, and very, very warm thank you to Kay Mercer from the library here, who's really, it's her energy and, and enthusiasm who made this evening and the rest possible. So thank you, Kay, for hosting us here. And to two people that will probably be mentioned in this talk and maybe others, Professor Paul Glue is the head of psychological medicine at the Canadian School of Medicine, just a few blocks down the road, who is uh, probably New Zealand's uh, most talented psychopharmacologist, who about a year ago uh, had me come down here for an interview and he said, well, we really need someone to do some serious research into aging, uh, especially in the context of brain aging and psychiatry, and would you come and join the team? And I said, well, you know, the university pays way less than my <laughs> salary as a consultant up in Christchurch. He says, yes, but we will fund your research. And I said, well, I'm coming, just say no. <laughs> so that was about a year ago, and as we, my partner and I were packing up after the interview and the whole process of being accepted for the position, Friday afternoon, one of the hotels here in town, we went down to the lobby and the guy said, where are you going? He said, well, back to Christchurch. He said, well, SH1 is closed with ice and snow. He said, well, that's news. What do we do? He said, well, you'll have to stay overnight, obviously. We drove out on Saturday afternoon and Professor Blue called me on Saturday evening. He said, that never happens. It's so unusual. You shouldn't think that this is the weather in the meeting. It's really nice and warm here most of the time. Well, I guess he was maybe overestimating how warm it can be. But uh, Professor Blue is brilliant and he supports our uh, efforts to do some serious brain research here. And uh, alongside with him, Professor Kat Scott, who is probably, maybe not many people know her name, but probably New Zealand's leading scientist, brain scientist at the moment. Uh, and she is my mentor for some of the projects I'll mention. And uh, these are two important people, but we couldn't do our work without uh, Ross uh, Martin, who is our administrative uh, leader, and uh, she helped also from the university side of things to put everything together. So I'm thankful for all of them. I'll just use the time to say something more about housekeeping. We are basically, the library closes at 8. Uh, it would be appropriate if we sort of left the room at half 7, uh, giving time for whatever it is that needs to be done before everything is closed down. So we have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end of each meeting, but also please feel free to stop me halfway through or whenever something is unclear. It is obvious that English isn't my first language, so if something is unclear about my accent or whatever grammatical errors I make, just raise your hand and I'll be happy to answer any question or clarify anything as we go through the talks. Uh, today we'll just be doing an introduction to brain health and if we are lucky enough and have enough time, we'll just start to delve into the prevention of Alzheimer's disease itself. So there are sort of two talks planned for today. We'll see how we go with the time. And in two weeks' time, and two weeks' time again, etc., we'll be looking at music, and we'll be listening to music and its effects on the brain, and social isolation, and we'll very carefully tread into the area of brain food, very carefully because for someone who grew up in the Middle East and came here, you walk into one of the supermarkets here and you think that this is mass suicide. <laughs> you know, they're selling just about everything that would really harm your brain is on sale. So it's like a shock, but uh, very difficult uh, 
to change our nutrition because it's embedded and imprinted in the way we grew up and remember food from our mother's kitchen, etc. And food is a cultural, familial and personal choice and makes it very hard to talk about food, but we will be talking about food and about a brilliantly designed nutritional plan by, plan by the US government that can reduce your risk of Alzheimer's disease by more than 50% within a couple of years. So we really need to talk about that, but we'll do that a bit later when we are used to each other, so you won't throw scones or butter at me. You should be throwing them out of your kitchens, but... And we should, of course, be talking about the misconception that Sudoku is great for your brain. Some people are just feeling great, great about themselves because they do crossword puzzles or Sudoku and think they're really doing something important for their brain. What a waste of time. <laughs> so we need, we need to talk about brain exercise and, and finally about what are the real recommendations of the American government, which were published just a few weeks ago, and of the UK, of the English government, which were published just last week. What do we seriously need to do to keep our brains really, really healthy? So that's sort of an overview, and we'll see all about that. And of course, we'll talk about meditation and physical exercise, and maybe more specifically about things we need to do as a society, as a culture, as a city. What do we do about loneliness and social isolation, which are probably two of the greatest risk factors for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. So there's a lot to cover. I'm not sure we can all do everything in the following today in the following four sessions, but we'll give it a try. Uh, and one last word before we delve into the brain and how to keep it healthy. Uh, on a personal note, uh, my name is Yoram Barak. doesn't mean anything in English. has a lot of meaning in Hebrew, like all Jewish children born about 60 years ago. Uh, my first and family name from the Old Testament, from the Bible. That was the tradition. You couldn't have a name that's not in the Bible. And all names in Hebrew that start with a Y-O or a J-O, like Jonathan or any other name like that, or Joel or Yechezkel or whatever, a Y-O or J-O actually stands for Jehovah. It's a short form for God. So all most male Jewish names have something to do with God. My name means praise God. But... Uh, why uh, mention that? Because I was obviously born in the Middle East in Israel. Uh, my parents were both born in Israel and my grandparents, which are relevant to why I do old age psychiatry, came to what was then Palestine uh, at the uh, sort of the closure of the 19th century in 1895 and 96. So I was one of a very, 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 very few people in my age group, in my cohort, who actually grew up having grandparents. About 95% of my peer group never had a grandparent because they all died in the Holocaust. So they didn't have any grandparents. They just had parents. So every weekend when my grandparents were coming over to stay with us, or we were going to a city about 20 miles away to spend the weekend with them, a lot of my friends would show up or ask if they can join us because they didn't have the experience of having a grandparent. And spending that much time and appreciating them and looking at them through the eyes of my peers and my friends, as we grew up, I realized that the elderly are a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant cohort of people. So I stopped talking to young people. I find them boring. I never treated anyone who is under 65. The only single person who is younger than 65 whose company I find entertaining is my daughter. But that's obviously subjective. So I grew up in a country that was very much skewed towards having young people. And, uh, but I had that brilliant experience of having four grandparents who lived to a ripe old age. So I was in my mid or late 30s when my grandparents passed away. And that experience probably shaped the way that I chose to do old age psychiatry. And I finished, completed my three years of army service and went to med school at Tel Aviv University. And then I, uh, which was seven years, and then six years of training in old age adult psychiatry, and then I wanted to train in old age psychiatry, but I couldn't because there wasn't any training program in Israel. 
Everyone was young, or so they thought. And the feeling was that we'll never age. So why invest in gerontology or geriatrics or old age psychiatry? I was lucky enough to be accepted for a training in the Institute of Psychiatry in London under the very, very brilliant, still very brilliant Professor Raymond Levi, who was one of the leaders of old age psychiatry in the world, and he actually convinced the UK government that every training program in psychiatry should be training people to do old age psychiatry as well, because we are going to see a change in demographics of the world as we go through our careers, and while 8% of the population uh, uh, in the Western world was over 65 years, about two generations ago, currently it's about 12%. By the year 2030, one in four people in most Western countries will be 65 or older. In Japan already, one in three people is 65 or older. And this is going to be the complete change. We will be changing from a demographics where young people are the largest majority of the population into a demographics where the elderly will be a significant minority or maybe at some time in the future even the majority of people. And it's not only changing the numbers, also the finance and power that comes along with aging nowadays is completely different from my parents or my grandparents cohort because 2002 for the first time in Canada more than 50% of the wealth was actually held by people 65 years and older. In the US, 2007, more than 50% of homes are owned by people 65 years and older. So, and people are more educated nowadays than my grandparents era. So we're looking at a population that not only will grow in numbers, but it will be highly educated financially, way better off than my grandparents, much more healthy physically because of vaccinations, because of the different availability of food after Second World War, etc., etc. So the world is going to change and instead of being the domain of young people who are noisy, drunk and often <laughs> irresponsible, it's going to be our domain. And we need to think about that because if we want to age successfully, we need to invest in our brain health. So I was able to convince Kay to give me this space and time to talk to you about that. And that's why we need to talk about brain health. So I'll start off with a question which I'm stealing from Lisa Genova, the scriptwriter who wrote the script for the movie Still Alice. It's out there. I don't know if many of you saw it. Uh, Juliana Moore was playing and she actually uh, received the Oscar for Best Actress for that movie. And it's a movie about a young well, relatively young, 50 professor of literature in the U.S. Alec Baldwin is also in the movie for women who like that sort of man. But, <laughs> and, and she is beginning to suffer from early onset Alzheimer's disease. And the movie is about how her family and, and her partner and her colleagues are reacting to that and how she is coping with that, what she feels at first to be quite terrible news. And Lisa Genova, whenever she talks about it, she's actually a, a doctor of neuroscience at Harvard University, and she wrote that book, uh, which nobody actually wanted to buy. She had to publish it on her own, using her own funds, but then it went viral, became a bestseller, and one of the big publishing houses in the US bought the rights, and then they sold the movie rights, and everything just came true for her. And put across quite a good message, and it is a very important movie to watch. American, in the way American movies are made, but it, it sort of true to the, to the message of what happens when one has to cope with the news of suffering from Alzheimer's disease in a family member, and how one copes it on the, the news. And she always says, when she talks about that script and that movie, she says, most of us are expecting to live to old age. So how many people would like to live to be 85 years old? <laughs> Anyone wouldn't? I guess people wouldn't want to be 90 or 95 years old. 
By the way, just a footnote, when we say elderly, which is really a bad choice of word, we generally in, in epidemiology mean 65 years and older, which is really, really, really a bad choice because people who are 65 are biologically not much different than people who are 55 and are not considered to be elderly. But that was sort of the, the idea that 65 is the age where you become elderly uh, was put forward uh, where and when. Who came up with the brilliant idea that 65 is when you are elderly? Some German blood, wasn't it? Austrian blood, yeah. The Kaiser, the, the king or the Kaiser of Austria at the end of the 19th century was unable to find people who would come to work for the government of Austria because he wasn't really paying well and people didn't feel they want to be government employees. So he came up with a brilliant idea that we nowadays call pension or retirement fund. He said if you come and work for the government when you are 65, he was talking to males, women were usually not part of the uh, uh, working force then. He said, when you make it to 65, I'll give you this thing called pension. You won't have to work anymore and I'll pay you monthly. So people flock to work for the government. Mm -hmm. Now, he was quite, quite an intelligent bloke because life expectancy in Europe at the year 1900, 1900, 117 years ago only, what was the mean life expectancy in Europe at that time? Ah, he was a clever guy. He wasn't going to pay many people. 49. <laughs> yeah. So he sort of calculated that it's a, in a way, a false promise. Not many people would leave to 65 to collect their pension. But things have changed. And life expectancy currently in Western Europe is sort of just about 81. So many countries are trying to push retirement age up higher, because they're saying 65 is still young, which it is, but historically 65 was set by the Kaiser in Austria, and that's how we do our research. So if I'm not saying differently, when we say elderly, uh, we mean 65 years and older, and has nothing to do with real life now. So, our brains, how they age, and some misconceptions about them. Any question, by the way, up to now? We are fine. Okay. So, the simplified version of to, how to keep our brain healthy is to keep all of our brain cells alive, and as we go through the life cycle, and as we age, to even help and create new brain cells. Now, this is really simple. Well, at least it sounds simple. It, it is quite a unique bit of knowledge that we didn't have many years ago. So about 20 years ago, if you were to open a neurology or a psychiatry or a neuroscience textbook, you would sort of learn, of course this is a mistaken bit of information, but we didn't know that about 20 years ago, you would learn that you are born with a set number of brain cells, billions and billions and billions and trillions of them, but there was a set number, and every day a few thousands or maybe more would die so that by the time you're <coughs> 75 your brain loses about 10% of its weight so a slow process but there it is and we can unfortunately human beings are really good at accelerating that so every time you have a shot of vodka or a glass of brandy or whiskey you're killing about 5,000 brain cells not a great idea is it? <laughs> but and there are other things we can do to kill our brain cells. Young people do that really well. They <laughs> sniff cocaine, and that is the number one reason for stroke, for brain damage in young people. But when you are young, you're thinking your brain will serve you just like you're thinking your body will serve you forever. So the idea was that you're born with a set number of brain cells, and they die, and you just can't do anything about it. Well, it's all wrong. We are born with a number, a set number of brain cells, but we can regrow the ones who die and we can even generate new brain cells in a process called neurogenesis, the creation of new brain cells. 
Now, our brains have many, many, many different kinds of cells in them. The ones who are really important for thinking and feeling and speaking and orientation and understanding music and communication and human relationships and enjoying art are the gray brain cells, so-called neurons. These are the ones we really need to invest in. And we can create new neurons. A small minority of people as they age actually increase their intelligence up to the age of 90 or 95. We call them super agers. They are a great interest for scientists. And we love to collect them and see what makes them tick. Why are they different from people who are not like that? But our brain's plasticity and ability to grow and increase its intelligence is inherent and it's there for all of us. We just have to know how to tap into that. So that's the idea that we really, 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 really need to increase the number of our brain cells. So we can do that by two parallel processes. One, reduce the number of insults or risk factors that actually cause more brain cells to die in our brains. And the other way is to help stimulate growth of new brain cells. So we'll talk about these two processes sort of in a mixed way. We won't differentiate one from the other. We'll obviously see as we go through the slides which are which. So that's the whole basic message and let's see what we know about it from a scientific point of view, if you like. So what's the first thing we really need to do to help our brain cells avoid the inevitable death that comes with the progression through the life cycle and with other, as I said, problematic behaviors and circumstances which accelerate brain cell death. Well, first of all, we need a seriously good night's sleep. We need six as a minimum, preferably seven or eight hours of uninterrupted sleep. When I say good night's sleep, that is because most sleep people who are not you know, sort of shift workers or have a very different lifestyle than the majority of us, most people sleep at night. So that's where we study the effects of sleep. We do study people who are different, who walk in shifts and sleep during the day and walk during the night, but they are unique. Most of us sleep at night, like many other mammals. Yeah. So why is sleep so important? Because when we create memories, we create them for a very, very, very brief period of time. Our brain needs to go to a process, a chemical process of producing an imprint of the memory into our proteins that are kept in our brain cells in order for that memory to be available over a long period of time, what we usually call our long-term memory. So the shift in the chemical systems that holds our memory for seconds to those of our chemical systems that can keep our memories going for years and decades and for a lifetime. Most people remember their parents' name for 60, 70, 80 years for their lifetime. So some memories are kept in our brains for the duration of our lives. So that shift happens when we sleep. And we need to sleep really well and uninterrupted sleep for that to happen. And if we were to take 200 bright young people here at the School of Medicine, give them a scientific publication to read and tell them that they are going to be tested about that next in 24 hours, next morning. And we split them into two groups. One group gets on with their day and then they go to sleep. They come back the next morning to take the test. The other group we keep at the university and we don't let them sleep. We keep them awake for 24 hours. And when we give them the test, the people who are awake all night do really badly. Because the memory hasn't moved from short-term memory into long-term memory storage and they can't come up with the answers. So sleep is really, really, really important for the brain. GPs know all about sleep hygiene. A bad idea is just to try and sleep using, as I said, a glass of brandy before bedtime. Some people think it's a great idea to exercise seriously 
and, and intensively before bedtime because then you'll be tired and fall asleep easily. You might fall asleep easily, but your sleep will be interrupted. So it's not a good idea. So there's a lot of data about sleep hygiene and how to improve our sleep quality because paradoxically, as we age, our sleep quality actually decreases. And we sort of think back with nostalgia about, you know, when we were teenagers and we could just fall asleep anytime, anywhere. Well, then we need different environments and a lot of quiet and relaxation to be able to sleep. But there's a lot of data that just your ordinary GP or if you go online and just Google sleep hygiene, you find a lot of things that maybe you're doing wrong and if you change those or take on some good hints, you can improve your sleep quality. Some people sleep during the day because their sleep has become interrupted as they age and they find that they're tired. So there are sort of a couple of hints about that. If you want to perform something, like if you know that you're going to have to drive a long drive or to have to do some other maybe cognitive chore in the afternoon or early evening, and then you should just have what the Japanese call the power nap, anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. And in many organizations around the world nowadays, it's actually mandatory. At about 2 or 3 o'clock, everyone just pushes away whatever they're doing, put their heads down, and just take a nap for 10 or 20 minutes. And it improves productivity significantly. So there's nothing wrong with having a power nap unless you're driving or your wife is talking to you. You better be away. At least that's what my partner says. You're yeah, taking another one of your naps when I'm telling you this important bit of information about our grandchildren. Good God. Don't keep awake. But anyway, uh, 60 minutes, a bit of a problem. A lot of people wake up quite groggy from a 60-minute midday nap. So if you're going to go for that, you might as well go for 90 minutes. That's much better for our sleep-wake cycle. What else about our brains? Well, one of the worst enemies of our brain cells is depression. Depression really, really, really destroys brain cells in a specific pattern. So if we look at people who are depressed, if we have a brain CT or someone who's been depressed for six months and hasn't been treated properly or has not been treated at all, because depression is a stigmatizing illness and it's sort of like a psychiatric illness and people don't like to talk about their mood and their feelings and, and to admit that they are depressed, because there's a lot of stigma around depression and around mental illness in general. So if you are suffering from depression that's untreated or you haven't recovered from it because treatment wasn't effective and you haven't gone through the process of recovery yet, if we were to scan your brain in a brain CT or any other imaging yeah. machine, you would see that a part of your brain that is uniquely designed to create and store memories has actually atrophied brain cells died and that part of the brain becomes smaller and smaller. And when we treat people and they recover from depression and we follow that up with another brain CT, we see that the brain, that area called the hippocampus or hippocampus, that area in their brain actually regrows and comes back to its original size. So it is a reversible process if you are aware of that. So there's a lot of stigma with depression but the good news is that for some people easily, for some people it's a struggle, but everyone with intense treatment recovers from depression. Everyone. No one stays depressed forever. We can help everyone recover from depression, but we need to diagnose it and to treat it properly. And actually, Clinical experiments across the Western world show that GPs are just as good at treating depression to recovery as psychiatrists. So if you are unhappy going to see a psychiatrist, many people are unhappy seeing us. I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, I can understand that if you want to see me, but most of my colleagues are really pleasant, <laughs> intelligent people. Why not see them? But some people are sort of, you know, have all these, in the background, all these 
misconceptions. If I see a psychiatrist, they'll take away my driving license, they'll take away my whatever, hunting license, all sorts of things which are, none of them are true, but people do tend to think those, then go see your GP. And if you're thinking that someone who is close to you, or a friend, or anyone you think is depressed, talk to them about it and say, hey, it's not a big deal. It is a very, very biologically based disease, and it needs treatment, but it can be treated to recovery. So depression, and why do we mention depression? There are other disorders as well which might adversely affect our brains, but I specifically focus on depression because of its prevalence. Depression is very, very, very common. If we were to take 100 kids born today across New Zealand or the US or the UK, anywhere in the world actually, and we were to follow them for whatever length of time it takes until they all passed away at whatever age, 80, 90, 70, how many of them would suffer from depression sometime in their life? 50%? Well, not as bad as that, but about 27%. Depression is unbelievably common. One in four people will struggle with depression at some time in their lives. And with that terrible effect on our brain, structure and function, we need, and because we can treat depression to recovery, we need to really be aware of that. So if you're feeling something has changed for you in your mood or your ability to enjoy life, or someone close to you, or someone you care about, just make sure they see their GP and talk about it. I know it is culturally wrong to talk about feelings here in New Zealand. Nobody talks about their feelings. It's not like in the Middle East where all we do is talk about our feelings and then shoot each other. But it is really a bad way to go about running a country, but unfortunately that happens. But Depression is a biological disorder. It has nothing to do with being guilty or being lazy or pulling yourself out of it or just toughing it out. It's not. It's a very, very severe biological disbalance of the brain. And it needs treatment. Not necessarily with drugs. Some of the drugs are brilliant. Some of them are complex to, to prescribe and to handle. But there are other forms of treatments as well not necessarily drugs, depending on how severe your depression is, but it must be treated, otherwise you will be losing more and more brain cells in that area of your brain where your memories reside and are created. And that's not a good thing. Yes, please. When you get a little bit older, you start to lose your friends. Hmm? When you get a bit older, you sometimes lose your friends. Mm -hmm. And so you, get, you can get, be quite sad for a time. Mm -hmm. How do you dif differentiate between sadness and depression? Well, a brilliant question. We will be talking about loneliness and social isolation, I think, at our next uh, uh, meeting. But uh, the, the complexities of untangling normal sadness, if you like, or grief, if you lose someone very close to you, uh, and clinically meaningful depression, well, as I said, you need experience. There are criteria for the diagnosis of depression or grief and uh, sort of that's what we do as psychiatrists. That's why we go to seven years of med school and then six years of psychiatric training and then two more years of old age psychiatric training. By the end of that, you're either depressed or you know what you're doing. <laughs> I hope you know what you're doing. But having mentioned the fact that uh, our brains are very sensitive to depression, from that follows, and a lot of science has been uh, put into proving, and it has been proven, that our brains are also very sensitive to other forms of stress. I don't mean physical stress, but psychological and social and, if you like, interpersonal stress. But before we talk about that, we need to remind you that I asked how many people would like to live to be 85 years old. And just about everyone said yes. Now, if you took a couple of seconds to look at two people around you in the room, just find two people you can look at. <laughs> if, if we were all to make it to 85 years of age, 
one of those people would be suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Very prevalent. But that's the good news. Because if we don't do anything about Alzheimer's disease, by the time our grandchildren will be 65, Alzheimer's disease is predicted to be much more prevalent. And we'll talk about that a bit later, but stress has a lot to do with that. And stress is really not good for our brains. But when we say our brains, let's just be on the same page for a second. When we talk about the brain, we talk about the part of the central nervous system that is encased in our skull. There are other parts of the central nervous system that go down to our spine. And then there are other parts of the peripheral nervous system which have nothing, well, nearly nothing to do with Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. So, when we say the brain, we mean that part of our nervous system that's within our skulls. Now, if one of you were to volunteer, and I'd be happy if one did, and we were able to open their skull and take out their brain, <laughs> how much would that weigh? Hmm? A kilo? Did I hear it? Two kilos. Anyone give me more? Less. Way less. No one has a two kilo brain. Not even Einstein. Actually, brain weight has nothing to do with IQ. We'll say something about that in a second. So, on average, on average, the human male brain is just under one and a half kilos. And the human female brain is just under one kilo and a quarter, one kilo and 250 grams. And we are really proud of that fact, we being males. We really love that. It's in all the textbooks. We have about 250 grams more of brain weight. Now that sounds really good, doesn't it? Only problem is it has nothing to do with our intelligence or with our cognitive abilities. Because the brain, if you've ever seen a brain, it's quite convoluted, it sort of looks like a walnut. Now, just imagine if you take out a brain, I don't know who volunteers for that tonight, but we'll no. see. Obviously you won't have to volunteer again next time we meet, but if we were to take out a brain, just imagine that we ironed it out into a large sheet. Okay, and then we measured the area of that sheet, we would know what is the surface area of the brain. That correlates with our intelligence. And women on average have anywhere between 12 to 17 percent more brain area than men. And unfortunately, when we do IQ testing, intelligence testing, or other cognitive abilities, women on average do about 10 to 15 percent better than men. We don't like to publicize it. <laughs> so I won't say any more about that. We'll be happy with our heavier brains and get on with the talk. But <laughs> that has a lot to do with what we'll be talking about later, but also with stress. Stress is, in a way, a unique phenomenon for human beings. Animals, of course, are also faced by stressful circumstances or events, but because of the way their memory and their psychology, if you can call it that, is, has developed over the evolution of millions and tens of millions of years, for them stress or an event, stressful event is something that has a beginning, a middle and an end and that's it. For some human beings stress can be very chronic and can go on for months and years. Studies by German researchers show the people who lose their job, they are fired, have indices and, and markers of stress for as long as seven years down the line. People who are divorced, that process can affect our immune system for a minimum of two to three years. When we are stressed over a long period of time, when we are facing chronic stress like unemployment, and broken families, and grief, and war, and human suffering that doesn't just end, but it's there for a long period of time, poverty, etc., our immune system is perturbed, and it is actually not working really well. So, the first thing that 
well, not the first, but one of the risk factors for chronic stress is actually suffering from cancer because our immune system doesn't control and monitor our body well enough to pick up cancer cells when they're really just at the beginning of change and killing them. So people who've had major stress, if you follow them up for two, three years, they have an increased rate of cancer. Not of depression necessarily, which you would think sort of that's what our bodies would react with to chronic stress. So stress is really bad for the immune system. And when the immune system is in trouble, our brains are in trouble. Because there's a whole world of what we call neuroimmunoendocrinology, that communication between our brain and our body is mainly through the use of hormones as messengers, but more than that, through the brain's influence on the immune system. And uh, immune cells, the so-called white blood cells, go everywhere in our body, but they go and do whatever the brain sort of tells them to do. But it's a two-way process, because our immune cells also cross the blood-brain barrier. They get into our brain, and if we are under chronic stress, they damage our brain. Now, why is that? Because we, just like all the other mammals, monkeys, cats, dogs, lions, whatever, zebras, when, well, unless you're really one of those people who believes in the biblical description of how we were created, so let's just assume that we were not created within a week by God, but that we, about a hundred thousand years ago, we decided to distinguish ourselves from our fellow apes and monkeys, and we stood up on two legs and started walking which was the major change that sent us off into a trajectory of eventually becoming human beings as we know ourselves. So we stood on two legs, what were then our hind legs, and we started walking in the savanna in Africa, and we got really good in using our hands, but there were also a lot of problems, that's why we have so many problems with our back, and back pain is very common because our bodies are not really designed to stand on two legs. They are designed for us to sort of scramble around on all fours. So we started walking around and we, not being very, very strong animals, we were prey to quite a lot of predators. So our bodies, through the evolution, to these 100,000 years until we sort of ended up here, learned how to react to acute threats. So if you were walking in the savanna about, whatever, 100,000 years ago, and you heard a rustle in the grass, you had two options. You could think it's a lovely bambi and go over and pet it, or you could think it was a lion. So if you made the right decision and it was a bambi, he would end up being your lunch. But if you made the wrong decision and it was a lion, you'd end up being its lunch. Not a great idea. So our bodies really were attuned to every rustle, every change in the environment, and within split seconds, less than one thousandth of a second, when our brain receives stimuli saying something bad is about to happen, that kind of stress our bodies are unique to cope and deal with, because these kind of stresses and signals actually save us. So we can really fight or flight. We can really escape or fight really fast and save ourselves and survive. But if that kind of stress goes on for days and weeks and months and years, our bodies are not attuned and they don't cope well with it. So the very same chemicals that activate our brain to react to acute stress are the chemicals that over time will kill our brain cells. They become neurotoxic over time. Our brain cells are good and respond beautifully when they are flooded by cortisone or cortisol, which you probably all heard of prednisone or cortisol. We use it a lot in medicine because it boosts the immune system. But if you give it over a long period of time, you get diabetes, you get bone loss, you put on weight, you have a lot of heart problems, and especially your brain suffers. So if we are unemployed for many months, or we're going through a long process of divorce and a breakup of family, and these are very common occurrences of 
every 10 young couples who are optimistic in love and get married in the US today, in 10 years time, four to five of them would have been divorced. Divorce is about 42 to 45 percent of all marriages in the US. I know about statistics here, but divorce is very common. And it's a huge stress, the breakup of families. So people who are under this sort of stressful conditions for long periods of time, their brains are constantly flooded by high levels of cortisone and other molecules which actually disrupt the immune system but are also neurotoxic and they kill our brain cells. So one thing we really need to be good about is managing stress. We'll be talking about that in detail a couple of talks down the line but I'll mention something that was well, sort of discovered or developed about 2500 years ago in India when the Buddha became enlightened. So after about a week of meditating under the Bodhi tree, he became enlightened and he uh, dictated his beliefs and, and, and philosophy. And the first thing he said, one of the, the first of the four truths is that we are born to suffer, which is probably true. Although I must say that New Zealand is a paradise, the beauty and the quiet and the loveliness of it. So probably here less suffering maybe than in other places, but as on a personal level we all suffer as we go through life. And that is true, but Buddha also suggested a way to stop that human suffering through the use of meditation. And his message was taken up especially in Korea and Japan around the year, about 2100 years ago, and they developed in Zen Buddhist monasteries a unique form of meditation which we call in the Western world mindfulness meditation. And that is a unique way to cope with stress. And it is currently the number one form of psychotherapeutic treatment in the US. It's unbelievably effective. We'll be talking a lot about that later. But we need to control and cope stress, otherwise we're going to pay quite a price for it. I mentioned Sudoku and crosswords, which are probably good for nothing for our brains. What a waste of time and paper and ink. So it's, it's you know. It's hmm? They are fun. <laughs> they are fun? Well, I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do them. I do whatever the science tells me to do. I wouldn't spend my time on something that's not, that may be fun. A, I personally believe, and we'll be talking about that later, it's much better to have fun if you're using a game where there's also some social interaction. Because then you're gaining two bonuses for your brain. You're socially engaged and you're having fun. But some people just, you know, sort of have fun on their own. Which is okay, but if you're going to invest in doing something that is enjoyable and fun, but also good for your brain, you need to invest in specific activities, which are what we call synthesizing activities. So, if you do crosswords or Sudoku, you are not actually learning anything new. You are using the same old pathways that have already been developed in your brain. You are not learning something new and challenging, and you are not synthesizing new information or data, or computing something that is completely out of your comfort zone. So, some people just do crossword puzzles because they get so good at it, they just love them and everybody just, wow, how did you know? But there's really nothing new about it. And the same for Sudoku. I mean, it may be complex, but there is nothing novel about these numbers. So, a waste of time for our brain synthetic synthesizing activity. So what are the challenges and the games that we really, really recommend? As I told you, the American government published its recommendations through the National Agency of Science and Medicine about a month ago, and they specifically suggest that people play bridge. They didn't say anything about street poker. That's probably for young people and doesn't do much for your brain, although they seem to enjoy it too. Maybe less than Sudoku. Anyway, we need games which create novel experience and information for our brains. So bridge is like that because every time you deal a hand of bridge, it's new. 
And even if you had the same combination of cards six months or a year or two years ago, the other three people would have different combination of cards. The bidding may go the, a different way. It's a completely novel experience every time you play bridge. So something like bridge or chess would be very novel and, and quite a challenge for our brains. People who don't like card games uh, and really want to challenge their brains in a fun, enjoyable way, the highest form of challenge for the human brain is actually music. So if you learn to play a musical instrument while also learning to read the notes, that is the hardest challenge for the human brain. Harder than playing bridge, harder than doing mathematics. Our brains are uniquely challenged by music. We'll be talking about that and seeing part of a movie, a documentary which is unbelievable, called Alive Inside. Maybe some of you have heard of it, but we'll be seeing it here, down the line, in one of our meetings. And music is a unique challenge to the human brain because our ability to call it understand music or emotionally feel that we are reacting to the music is very complex for the brain. So that's a great challenge. So learn to play a musical instrument or at least get into the habit of listening to classical music. Other forms of music have been tested, they're not really great. Especially not those popish metal, whatever techno things that our kids listen to. Classical music is very complex in the combination of sounds and the, the dynamics of the uh, uh, composed pieces and that's a huge challenge for our brain. And of course another huge challenge is learning a second language. It doesn't have to be some form of exotic, you know, sort of native Malaysian or whatever. I don't know. It doesn't have to be some form of rare Mongolian language. It can be a language, some people are saying, but if I learn Italian or Spanish or French or mm, German, it's easy because they think that just because the ABC, the way we write the letters, we already know them, then it makes it easier. It doesn't. Learning a new language is a great challenge to our brain. Also brilliant. So games, especially ones who are demanding, synthesizing new information in a social context are probably the best way to create new brain cells and they are created because when we play games and that was found about 27 years ago a London cabby driver was involved in a car accident nothing serious, sort of bumper thing but because of insurance issues he took himself off to the nearest emergency department and he complained of headache, and although he didn't lose his consciousness or anything, and he had a brain CT. And when the radiologist, who didn't see the man, was sitting in his office and just looking at the brain CT, suddenly got up, rushed out of the room and said, who is this man? And everybody was like, what's wrong? And he went and talked to him, and he said, and you know, the cabbie driver was quite disturbed, all the attention, so there's something wrong with me, and the radiologist said, well, the part of your brain that has to do with orientation in space is about three times larger than the human norm. Now, in those days, unlike now where you have all these applications will take you anywhere, when you applied for a license to drive a cab in London, it was a two-year course, part of which, the great part of which, you had to learn the map of London by heart. And you were tested on that, both theoretically and in action. Like, you would have to take the examiner to some address somewhere in London. London is a huge metropolis. Learning the map of London by heart is quite challenging and finding your way physically to that, driving a car. So people who practiced that for two years and then that was their job in a sense. They drove a cab and that's basically what they did. The part of their brain that is responsible for orientation in space is huge. It's about three times the part of Probably in my brain, I can't find my way anywhere. But And then that gave rise to a lot of investigations showing that people who train at a particular skill, that is a cognitive skill, that part of their brain 
actually creates more and more and more brain cells that are integrated into a network, making them, if you like, experts in that particular skill. That's what led to other research saying, hmm, then maybe we can train our brains to remember more. That's a skill. Remembering is a skill, which is true. So if you take up the, you know, most of you are too young to remember, but we used to have telephone books. I mean, I tell my daughter that, she goes like, you had what? <laughs> the telephone books, you didn't just go online to find a number, you know, you had to actually, and there were public telephones, that's way beyond the ability to comprehend. So if you take the telephone directory and you learn it by heart, you will be increasing that ability in your brain. So that sounds like a boring but good exercise. Actually, it's bad exercise because the, the obstacle to just doing something like that and improving your memory is that our brain cognitive functions are discrete. So if you train in finding your way, being a cabbie, you do that really brilliantly well, but when we test London cabbies on simple memory tests, they don't do better than you or I. Give them a list of words to remember by heart. They don't do better than us just because the part of their brain that has to do with orientation has become excellent and enlarged. So there is no generalization of function. If you train for one function, you'll do that one better, but you won't do others better. That's why we need games and exercises that cross through a lot of brain functions at the same time. And of course physical exercise, we'll talk about that quite a lot. We need to exercise our bodies to keep our brains healthy. Not indirectly because when we exercise we get other benefits. Our cardiorespiratory health is better, our fitness is better, it helps to keep our weight down, blah, blah, blah. That's fine, that's important. But no, when we exercise, our bodies secrete a specific chemical that helps maintain the integrity of brain cells, especially of the neurons, the gray brain cells, which have to do with memory and cognition and language and emotions. We don't know why that is, but probably has some advantage in an evolutionary sort of sense that if you are fit, that would give you an advantage, but also give your brain an advantage. So we need to exercise daily. There are so many myths about exercise, but we'll be talking about that. Like people tell me, I exercise one day and then I rest the next. And I go like, do you run a marathon every day? He says, no, I just take a walk for half an hour. <laughs> well, you don't need to rest the next day. That's not really strenuous exercise. We need to exercise for a minimum of 35 to 45 minutes daily. And there are a lot of, of misconceptions about what exercise is. People tell me, well, I do the vacuuming. Well, that's good for you, but that has nothing to do with your brain. And why would anyone do the vacuuming? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, no, gardening or doing the vacuuming is not physical exercise in the medical sense. So we'll be talking about that as well. And we need not only aerobic exercise, we also need what we call resistance exercise. So we need to add some weight exercises to our weekly routine. It's not enough just to cycle or jog or swim. That's not enough for the brain. It's maybe good enough for our hearts, but not for our brains. But you were wanting to ask something. Yeah, I was wondering if um, solitaire on the computer would count as a... If? Uh, the game solitaire on the computer, the card game, does that... Would I that guess it's, it's, it's not that complex, but it's not that bad. But again, I think the name just gives me shivers. So <laughs> which means, you know, it's a solitary occupation. Why would you choose to do that if you can, if you like card games? Well, the bridge people say, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Well, you can play bridge on the computer, by the way. There are many, many, many free download programs where you play one hand, computer plays the other three hands, your partner and your position, and they're quite exciting. I have on my iPhone a bridge game. I play whenever I'm sort of waiting for whatever, in line for something. So I play a game of bridge. And if I don't win, no one knows. <laughs> Coffee. 
We need lots and lots of coffee to keep our wines healthy. Yes. Now that